Okay, guys, welcome back to the channel. I'm going to give you a little different backdrop today. Actually, showcasing the Bach Grand, which I just received. It's the state of the art, no holds barred, $50,000 plus DAC. This chassis alone and the parts inside, point to point wiring. Maybe I'll put up some pictures. This is heaviest thing I probably brought up into my room other than speakers. Incredibly heavy. Well, the subwoofer probably is even more. But yeah, this thing is incredible. And I'm going to have a whole video series on that. One of the rarest pieces in the hobby. Because not only are you getting cost no object DAC, point to point wiring, linear power supply, all the state of the art stuff you see in the very best DACs. But you're getting the Bach and the ability to cross over. This has actually got a six channel DAC, which a lot of those mega dollar DACs don't. So you can actually use it to actively cross over your speakers. And Edgar's actually built in some pre done curves for certain speakers that he's used and worked, tested a bunch of speakers. So he can actually help you with that as well. It's probably one of the rarest and most high tech pieces in the entire hobby. So I'm happy to have this here as a counterbalance to the Bach for Mac. I know a lot of you guys have very mega dollar systems and can't vision putting a Mac mini and an RME, totally get it. That's part of the hobby as well, the aesthetics and that attention to detail. It's the difference between like using a Timex and a Rolex. You know, the Timex is gonna tell the time pretty much the same as a Rolex, but that quality of engineering, that nth degree of performance and pride of ownership, this is what you're gonna want. So I'll have a lot more on that in the future. Also got the subwoofer amp from Angel Gilbert Young coming. So that's another fun thing. Uh, also have a Zoom actually tonight scheduled with Jeff of Blue Jeans Cable where we're going to talk about the power cables. I already have a member of mine that took a delivery on some of the power cables and actually reordered. So and then I learned some things from Jeff that I said we got to do this on a Zoom because I wasn't even aware of certain things with power cables that can definitely that they've done some testing can make a difference and you're going to hear that in an upcoming zoom but i wanted to get this video out on my series while i had some time before we start the show series up again of talking about some topics i've always wanted to get to and one of the things that came up recently is asking me well if you ran stereo file absolute stereo, whatever or created your own actual review magazine or uh you know we're that type of in the industry what would you do differently than what these people have done? Because I have been critical of them in the past, and I actually, in the membership section, have a video that talks about what reviewers you could trust, and I do uh, expose some things that really bothered me. But what would I do to fix it? It's, not, it's easy to criticize. What would I do to fix it if I was in charge of such uh, periodicals or created my own? So I wanted to go through in this video, listening a few of these things. Mainly, number one, because people have asked, but also get your feedback. Uh, is this something that would interest you? Uh, maybe some of these magazines will take some of these to heart and start doing it. Now, the first thing that prefaces all of these suggestions is the fact that I know you cannot get past the firewall charade of advertising versus reviews. These, these, these periodicals need to make money. So there's always gonna be a demand for advertising on these you can't do it just on subscription basis you know you guys don't like to pay that much for these magazines they have to be supported by the companies that do advertising and so i'm acknowledging that that's just going to be part of the business it's just like going into a dealer they're going to pimp whatever they sell more than other stuff you as a consumer have to be at least somewhat cognizant of that and use buyer beware and also use your own intuition on that metric, I'm not gonna be able to solve that for you. The, none of these periodicals are gonna go do it just pro bono. I'm the closest thing on YouTube doing things pro bono, but even now I represent some products. Uh, but I do this show coverage totally free. Every video that has music is totally free. I make no money from. But again, there's not many people that have the luxury to do it the way I do it. And that's why you haven't seen <laughs> it done that way. But I can see where it's gonna make sense for these businesses to make money. I don't wanna begrudge them that. But what can we do differently to help you guys um, and them, I think, in the long run? The first thing that I would um, do is with every reviewer, they always have these bios of their reference gear. Well, the first thing I would change is immediate. And that actually 
what these reviewers are using for, using for reference gear is actually uh, a big advertising, even bigger than the, what the companies pay for. Because people subliminally think, oh, if they're using it in their system and they're a you know hoity-toity reviewer, then that must be great gear. So having that in a reviewer's reference gear list, um, that's huge. But so many times that gear is only in their system because it was loaned to them, given to them, or at extreme discounts. And I'm not talking about 10%, 20%. I'm talking about huge discounts, 40, 50, even more, uh, if not free or on loan. I would make every reference list of every reviewer indicate which pieces they bought versus which pieces are loaned or on heavy discount. Because then you would know if you put out your own money, everything in my room pretty much is my bought. I bought it. So and keep it. So there's no motivation to flip it. There's no motivation because I got to take new stuff in. I'm buying this stuff for its performance in the long term. And I think that that would help you identify which reviewers are so sold on the piece that they have in their equipment that, that they put their money where their mouth is. That's the best review you can have. So I would like to showcase that in their uh, reference systems, that delineation of what gear they bought. Um, the other thing I would do is a bio with room measurements in their room. I've exposed this in the membership section. Some You've actually seen in Stereophile in-room measurements of some of these famous reviewers. And it's ridiculous, in my opinion, for anybody to be evaluating gear with those in-room measurements. And, and those in-room measurements are only like a short distance away from the speaker. It's not even at the listening position, which I can assume is even worse. So this is where in-room measurements at the listening position are super critical for me to have any faith in what you're saying. Yeah, jargon, audiophile jargon sounds great, but you almost never see reviewers agree on the same piece of gear. Reason being, their rooms are different and where they sit is different. And to that end, another thing I would change, uh, I think this is now my fourth thing or third thing, is have certifications for their hearing. Did they take some blind tests? You know, I'm a CPA. My, Doug is a doctor. You have lawyers that have to uh, pass a different uh, test to certify that they are an expert in that field. And they even have CPE, continuing public education, um, to improve that over the years and maintain it. I think that it would be helpful if reviewers, if you're going to be in the hobby and be known as an authority to pass certain thresholds of not only your innate hearing from an audiologist, but how can you perceive things? And I've done this in a video I'll put up. Maybe you can go watch that video. Uh, there's a good site where you can test your own hearing and see what threshold of millisecond delays can you hear, what distortion measurements, um, timing, all these things you can perceive where you sit, your hearing sits on that benchmark. And those should be public for people to know how good your hearing is. A lot of these guys don't want that to be public. I can see why, because they probably wouldn't pass that stuff. But that will give you more comfort if you know and you still may agree with them or you may have the same issues that they have with not hearing certain things. So you may not worry about certain things that other people will worry about. It's all about finding the right gear for you, not be saying something is the best for everyone. You know, there's no such thing as best for everyone. But what is important with these magazines is helping you find what's best for you. And if you can benchmark yourself against the reviewer, both in subjective and these objective metrics, you're going to be much better off um, following their advice. But the other thing I think should be done is not just one reviewer review one piece of gear when it's brought to the magazine. I think all the people that work for the magazine should review that one piece and all of those opinions should be pr printed because that will give you, again, depending on which one of those reviewers you identify with most from these other metrics or past experience, then you will know better about that product. This guy may not hear like you, he may have a terrible room. He may say it's the best piece ever. You buy it, it's not going to be that way. There might be other guys, though, and I can name people at Stereophile I would trust and others I wouldn't trust, or any magazine, or even online, or on YouTube. There's people you can trust, based on my experience, and knowing some of these other metrics that I just talked about, 
and there's some that I wouldn't. So I would want to cure that if I was in charge. Okay, sorry, I had a low battery warning. I had to plug in the, the uh, thing before my battery went out. But the other thing I was going to tell you, the last point I wanted to talk about was measurements. I would still do measurements like Sterofile does, and they do a good job of put, providing a full suite of measurements. And then there's people online like Amir with ASR that does very comprehensive measurements, but here's where I would differ from and add and supplement the measurements, is that a lot of these measurements that they put out there are not audible. <laughs> And you will see when you take these blind tests, the difference between uh, jitter at this versus this, it's immaterial. Signal to noise ratio, uh, 135 signal to noise ratio DAC or amp compared to 130 is immaterial. <laughs> I mean, that is no way to rank a piece of gear other than you're just ranking it on en engineering prowess. And sometimes these measurements are misleading as we've seen in the past with distortion measurements for receivers they would just jimmy rig the measurements now most of these people that provide measurements do a good job of legitimate measurements but they still are misleading and piggybacking on that last video i did with subwoofers i'll tell you one thing that i find very misleading with measurements uh, a lot of tools will just use spl meters to judge frequency response in the base and that really doesn't tell the whole story when you actually start playing music. And that's why when I was looking at fixing the curve, I wanted my left and right channel to behave as close as possible together, everything to be in phase. Because you can play your speakers in phase, play some pink noise, in phase versus out of phase, and the SPL meter may still show the same volume in the room. But to your ears, it sounds very wacky um, and big difference. And same thing happens in the bass. You may get a nice curve from Direct saying, yeah, this is now flat. But if it was trying to fix out of phase stuff and, you know, just got the levels right, but not the phase right, then when those notes come up in a song, you will hear that it'll sound a little bit softer and weirder. And I don't like that. Technically, the measurements look good. But no, that's why I wanted to pay a lot of attention to getting things as much in phase as possible and why I think continuous phase on subs JR has been a big proponent of that. I'm a big proponent of that. Or having tools that allow you to get everything behaving together uh, in phase because that's something that often doesn't get shown in the measurements or you get misled that you've got a more flat response that should be more ideal than what your ears are telling you. And there's a lot of other examples of where the measurements don't tell the whole story. So that's what I would do is uh, provide measurements but also a lot of effort to how audible they are to most people, and where their limitations are, and certainly not rank gear strictly based on measurements. So anyway, just wanted to get that quick video out, uh, get your thoughts, what you thought. Uh, no, I'm not buying Stereophile, <laughs> but I'm just sharing some ideas of what I would do if I was in charge. Hope you enjoy, guys.